it uh, never works out. So um, thank you so much for your patience. I'm super, super excited to be able to um, be here today and being able to share with you um, what we have done here in Natick, Massachusetts with uh, using drones to teach coding. Uh, it's definitely something that's been new to us and uh, we're just super, super excited to be able to share this with you. Uh, here's my information. I'm actually a middle school teacher uh, here in Massachusetts. I came from the uh, business world way back when and ended up being a technology director for a number of years, worked with kids at the high school level and determined that I really enjoyed working with kids and ended up going um, back to school and becoming a teacher. So <clears throat> let's get started. I want to um, first start off, I'll have my information also at the end so you can watch, you can um, have my contact information. But here is just a quick video to show you, this is one of the first um, times that I worked with students to create an autonomous drone, drone um, mission. Initially, they were just, the first time that they did this, they were just gonna take off and fly through a hoop that you'll see at the end. Oh, and it didn't wanna show. Let's see if I can get this to, there we go. So you can see the excitement, you can feel the excitement, and you can tell that all of those students were engaged. Um, let's just cut, step back just a little bit and kind of talk about coding. I mean, everyone now is talking about coding and why, but it really does tie in well with the creativity focus of this conference. Um, you may think, you know, coding left brain, right brain, you know, do they really uh, overlap? But they really do. There is a lot of creativity that comes in uh, when you're doing coding. Uh, resilience and perseverance is something that I know our students struggle with. And coding is a way that they can have that opportunity to fail at something and yet really wanting to be able to succeed, especially when they're working with drones. They're willing to go back and try it over again and over again until they get it right. Uh, there's so many different curriculum connections. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, there's relevance. I mean, these are real world um, devices that are being used in their everyday lives and they see that. And so that's something that makes it really tangible and exciting for them. It's definitely a career uh, preparation. There's going to be a lot of um, aspects with coding in the future and so um, and currently. So that's something that really makes it real and relevant to them today with career preparedness. Um, it will improve their written communication. Um, with uh, trying this over and over again, it definitely builds confidence for students. Um, and then obviously their problem solving and critical thinking skills is a huge aspect of coding. And drones, and pulling drones into the entire picture is really just another tangible element. Sometimes you have students that, um, you know, get frustrated with you know kind of sitting for a long period of time and coding definitely involves you know a lot of focus and being able to really kind of work through those problems if you put a more kinetic aspect to it and you pull in some things that's really physical and tangible uh, you can get more students involved and we kind of see it as a progression we kind of start off in our elementary schools uh, using the um, mouse and go robot and working coding with them uh, then we introduce our students to uh, the whole code.org environment and kind of depending on their um, interest and kind of their skill sets we put them in different directions with code.org um, some students then will move into the scratch environment and for some students that's 
kind of too abstract. It's kind of too open-ended for them. Um, and some of them will move into the grasshopper uh, environment, but everyone wants to be involved once we pull the drones out and we start working with them. Uh, this is definitely 21st century skills. I mean, we're talking about collaboration, communication, the critical thinking, and the creativity. All of these tie back to, um, to the drones. Uh, as I referenced before, we have lots of different curriculum topics that you can cover. I mean, this can really be a true interdisciplinary um, unit if you'd like it to be. Uh, there's lots that can be done around general safety uh, with drones, about flight regulations, uh, why flight regulations exist, where do they exist. You'd actually be surprised uh, to know where they all come from and where um, all the different no-fly zones are. Um, there's lots of real world applications. Students can kind of see what's being done today and can also kind of envision what are some future um, uh, applications for drones, which is kind of fun and exciting. We're really kind of focusing on the math, specifically measurement and coding in what we're doing with our sixth graders. Um, but there's also um, possibilities for older students to deal with aeronautics and kind of figuring out more about like why the drones are successful in flying and why they're um, they're good for a number of different uh, topics. So just a couple of quick things related to the real world applications. You'll see like these are just some images of drones and how they're being used, you know, in um, preserving elephants, in deliveries, with police surveillance. Here's one of my coworkers when he first got uh, the drone, he took it home and he checked to see what the status of his gutters were, uh, just to see if they needed to be cleaned out or if they were clear. So lots of really exciting things. We're actually building a new middle school um, where I teach and we were taking the drones out every so often and kind of surveying the land to make sure that all of the environmental um, mediations were being um, followed through. And so we were, we were kind of monitoring those with the drones where, again, some real world applications right where we were using them, which was pretty exciting for the kids. Um, you'll notice that I had uh, the same drone. I'm kind of using the same drone over and over again. Um, my superintendent had sent out a notice last year saying, hey, look at these prices on these drones. Looks kind of interesting. Uh, sent it out to a whole bunch of people. Who's interested in getting a drone? And of course, I was the first one to apply and said, yes, please let me get one. Um, and I ended up picking two different drones um, to try out. One, um, I tried the Tello drones first and they work great. And I was like, that's wonderful. And I tried this other brand of drone, which is also, um, it was a, a hydro, allowed it to be a hydroplane as well as a drone like you could move the motors around in different positions and as soon as it took off it crashed into a wall and i was like okay that's not the drone for me uh the tello drone has definitely become my my drone of choice um, it can be flown indoors but it definitely needs to have a well-lit area um, it's uh, this visual sensing positioning it does not use gps so it's not as accurate as other high-end drones but for what we're doing it, it really will suffice um, the batteries are really quite small and they don't last very long so you get really about 10 minutes maybe 13 if you're lucky of fly time before they need to be recharged so um, it's really important to have lots of spare batteries on hand and you can buy them. If you buy the education pack, it comes with some extra spare batteries, but you can also buy a charger and some additional batteries right on Amazon for not too much. Um, it does have a camera, which also um, takes still shots as well as video, which is kind of fun and exciting. And it can work um, with virtual reality um, goggles if you want to fly like that if you want to fly live um, but we when we fly live we just use an app on a device it takes about 60 or 90 minutes to charge your battery so again you don't want to just have one battery you want to have a bunch of those um, the propellers can become detached which is okay it actually prevents them from breaking um, but just knowing how to put them on um, it's just they pops right pop right on but there's two different propellers so you got to make sure you put them in the right position and uh, the drones are relatively inexpensive they're um, I think I got a special last year and they were like $99 each but they seem to run about $120 for the uh, drone edu pack which again 
as I said, gives you some additional batteries. Um, there's a lots of different options for coding the drones. Um, initially, I was super excited with to use it with Scratch because that's something that a lot of my students were using anyway for coding. And it did require a little too much setup than what I was happy with. Um, it was running on the MacBooks that I have in my lab. And I also did not like the kids carrying around the MacBooks, which made me a little bit nauseous to watch them like just carry them around like it was a binder. Um, so I moved away from Scratch and I invested or I um, investigated the, the GoTello app, which um, is put out by the Tello company. Um, I didn't love it. The base app is free, but it only gave you like five commands, which wasn't really enough to do much of anything. Um, and then they wanted me to pay for it and I'm cheap. So that was not an option. So I kept looking. There was something else put out by Tello, which is called Tello EDU. Um, it looked like just basically another interface that was more kind of kid friendly uh, to the Go Tello app. Well, I didn't love that either. And then I came across a thing that I absolutely love, which is called Drone Blocks. Uh, not only is it an iOS and an Android app, but it also has a Chrome extension, which is why initially I was trying to use my Chromebook so I could show you um, the Drone Blocks um, extension. But I will there's I have some screenshots in this anyway, so it will still work. Um, it's completely free, and they have lots of awesome resources online uh, for Drone Blocks. You can take uh, Drone Block courses, um, which I definitely snarfed some information from to add to this and basically troubleshooting and things along those lines. Um, so really, really excited about drone blocks. And I think you guys will be too once I show it to you. Um, and then the last thing is, and I have not done this, but you can also use Python. So um, I kind of dove into a little bit, but it looked much more complicated to set up. And with my sixth graders, like simplicity is good. So drone blocks meets our needs and I didn't feel the need to go any further in that regard. So this is what I suggest that you do for a progression. Um, we're talking about setting up a mission. It's an obstacle course mission. So the way that I introduce that with my students is I first start by introducing the drone. So we review the different components of the drone and I demonstrate how they fly. And I actually do that live fly uh, demonstration myself. I don't let the kids necessarily do live flying inside the building. Um, when we go outside, you know, in Massachusetts, so um, we have at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, we can fly outside, but in, you know, in the winter, we're just flying purely inside. So um, I don't want them flying that inside because uh, they will crash because it's not as easy as you might think. Um, but I do let them set up the autonomous, obviously, um, missions to fly inside. Um, I have my students uh, do a flight log that I'll be sharing with you as well. So we discuss the uh, expectations of the flight log and the different roles of people um, on the flight team. And then I demonstrate how the autonomous flights work using drone blocks. And we're going to kind of dive into each one of those pieces. So the first thing is we're just going to set up uh, and kind of introduce the drone. In the front is the camera. Um, in the back is where the battery pack slides in and out. On the right, there's a tiny little button, which is the power button. And then on the opposite side is the USB charging port. So you can just leave the battery pack in the Tello, plug it in to um, your, via the USB, mini USB, and that's how it charges. But again, I recommend getting a multi-battery pack so you can fly the drone and you're just swapping batteries out as you need them. Um, the uh, drone flight log that I've put together, I've used it now with two classes. So I've set up kind of different crews and I keep kind of playing around with how best to utilize students so everyone's busy all the time because I really hate when kids are have downtime that equals trouble as you know if you teach middle school so we have kind of two everyone has two roles there's the first set which is the course crew the flight plan crew or the coding crew they all kind of work together and we'll break all of these down and I'll show you what I mean. And then the second is during the flight itself. So we have the safety crew that's making sure that no one, that the drone doesn't get stepped on and no one's kind of coming into the flight path. Um, the revision crew, they're the ones that are looking at 
the drone saying, oh, you know, we should have gone another 10 inches to the right and kind of making notes of that in the log. And then the pilot, and they're the person that's actually holding on to the device that has the code on it and, you know, starting the mission, launching the mission, and then being ready to abort the mission if, if all goes bad. Um, I create, I have them create a mission map. So before they even get started, they're going to do their measurements, kind of plan out what their map is going to look like before they even get to coding. And again, we'll dive into some more details in a minute with that. Um, this is what drone blocks looks like. Uh, these are all the different um, categories with the navigation, the flips, the loops, the logic, the math, the variables, and then on either end, the takeoff and the landing. Uh, these are kind of your beginner commands. I put on the set speed just because you don't want the kids to do this one. And I wanted to point this out. They all want to set the speed to like as fast as they possibly can. And you, you don't want to do that. So make sure that they don't use that particular command. I think I might have missed a, yeah, I'm going to jump back a little bit because I jumped past this one thing. Um, if you're using Tello drones with drone blocks, um, there's two different settings. And if you see this no aircraft connected and it doesn't say Tello blocks, you're in the wrong section. So you have to actually jump into this Tello blocks just in case anyone's going to take off with this. You'll notice that you're in the wrong one because things won't be in inches. It'll You won't have inches as an option. That's kind of one of the things that I found when I first started this. So just pick Tello blocks and then I'll show you what it looks like. Come on. Yeah, so you see up here where you see connected to Tello, now you know you're in the Tello um, blocks within drone blocks. So um, some of your other navigation things, you can you know fly up, fly down, you can use the X, Y, and Z axis, you can do curves, and you can hover for a time period, which is kind of cool. Um, they also have yaw right and left, so you can physically turn We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Good one. My computer is. All right. So first thing we're going to do, we have, um, these are all the steps that were involved in creating this obstacle course mission for the kids. I first laid out the obstacle course. Um, it's made with PVC pipe, some cones, and a bunch of pool noodles. And I just mark it on the floor with tape. So every time I have to break it down, because we're working in a um, cafeteria, I can bring it back the next day and quickly get it back into position. So the students, these are really the four steps. They're going to evaluate uh, the course. They're going to plan. They're going to actually create their code, and then they're going to test and then go back. So it really kind of is the uh, engineering design process just modified for this particular program. Um, first, they draw a map of the obstacle course itself, uh, and then they're going to indicate which directions uh, the drone should fly in and how many inches they need to move. Um, I decided to have the kids do the whole measuring portion of this because I had heard from our technology um, uh, engineering teacher that kids couldn't read a ruler. So I said, well, let's give them more experience uh, reading a tape measure. So uh, we've only lost three yardsticks and one tape measure so far. So the kids are kind of brutal with those things. So make sure you get ones that are pretty rugged. Uh, these are the drone flight logs. So each kid is on a team. Uh, the teams, depending on the size of my classes, can be anywhere from four kids to eight kids, you know, depending on how many you have. And here's an example of one of their maps, their planning maps that they had put together. So saying where they take off, what does that do, direction they go, how many inches, and this helps when they go to put their plan together. So here's uh, them working through the code. And then they go through their testing stage where they're trying to get through. Um, they we, they kind of have to zigzag through the first three in this particular scenario, the first three um, pool noodles, and then their final attempt has to go through uh, this uh, loop at the end. So here's, hopefully this will show, here's one where they actually succeeded. Yeah, we 
They got way too excited about this. I should have had them back up, but they were getting way into it, and I kind of was excited and wasn't really paying attention myself. Come on, Jim, boy. As you can see, kids were super, super excited. Um, some other ideas that you can do, um, rather than just setting up an obstacle course, uh, set a target and try to land as close uh, as they can or inside of the target. You could set up um, an obstacle course, but only allow half the team to see the obstacle course and create the map and then hand it over to the programmers and have them code it and then see how well they did. Um, you could have the students create drone dances. That's actually what we do as a kind of celebration after they are a they're able to. I only do, I don't have kids for that long, so I only have 15 classes with them total. Um, doing the whole obstacle course uh, mission takes probably about three classes with them. So on their fourth day, or if they finished early on the third day, I let them um, create a drone dance because they all want to use the flip option and I don't let them do that one. They're going through the obstacle course because there is no reason to. Um, another idea might be to do reverse engineering. So you could have um, students watch a drone perform a set of instructions and then see if they can recreate that same mission uh, just by kind of trying to figure out what, they, what the code was. Um, you could have students collaborate, strategize, and create their own drone games or challenges, which would be fun. Um, or you could break the group into like rescue teams uh, to collect uh, data in a specific rescue areas to locate maybe victims and relay information like how the drones could then help save someone in like a life or death situation, which might be kind of cool. Um, one of the things that we, I wish I had more time to work with my students with would be um, refractoring their code. Um, lots of things get repetitive, especially as they're flying through those cones uh, or the pool noodles that were evenly spaced. Um, and basically using some of the more sophisticated aspects of drone blocks, like repeat codes or if then codes and things like that, that would be pretty cool. I just haven't had a chance to do that with them. I mean, you can really use some advanced logic um, within drone blocks, and really you can use variables and set up some like pretty cool um, scenarios. And what might be neat is like to give your students this and ask, okay, so what's the result? Without you, before you even see the drone doing the work, what is going? What's going to happen? What do you predict will be the outcome of this code? And then actually watching it and seeing it happen and finding out if you were successful or not. That's also kind of a cool learning opportunity. Uh, just some basic safety ideas um, or information, like you do not want to fly over people. That's, um, you know, it, they're pretty safe. They have these little um, kind of uh, barriers on the side, but the propellers are open. And if they get caught in people's hair or something, it, it could be a problem. Um, you just want to be smart about where you fly. One of the things that I had done initially was when I was just free flying, we had this, um, we kind of have like an overlook that is on the second floor that looks down to the first floor. And I was flying and I kind of lost control of it and it dropped all the way down to the first floor and I had no idea who was underneath it. And I got lucky that it was between classes. Um, another time I was flying the drone and it was a little too windy outside and it ended up flying over the fence um, to where they were doing the build work. And so um, I had to ask someone to go to retrieve it for me because the battery died before I could get it back on the other side. So just kind of being aware and smart about where you fly, even as I tell the kids, even I made mistakes with that. Um, you definitely wanna keep the drone within your sights at all times. Be careful of hair and loose clothing. Uh, you don't wanna touch the blades while they're spinning. Uh, keep your distance when it's flying. And then watch your feet because they're really easy to step on 
We haven't had anyone step on one yet, but we've had so many close calls. And that's why it's really important to have like that safety um, group and the people that are like, like I tell them, your only job is to watch that drone. And then they become really kind of possessive about it. They're like, don't touch it. Don't look at it. Like, stop it. Don't touch it. You know, don't step on it. And, and it's, it's good. And my computer. Okay. So um, I'm here to help if uh, this is something that you think that you uh, might want to get into and you would like to talk to me some more about it. I'm super um, excited about it. I really love um, sharing my experiences with drones. I'm, uh, I'm relatively new at it too, but uh, I'm willing to help in any way that I possibly can. Um, this presentation is on Bitly. It's Code with Drones 30. If, um, if you'd like a copy of it, you can grab that there. And um, just, I have some additional information in this, uh, some troubleshooting. Sometimes the tellos can be a little, um, a little moody and, you know, the way that you connect and reconnect to them can be a little bit finicky, especially if you're working with multiple ones or if you're trying to save the batteries. So I put some of the, some of the things in here, just little kind of helpful tips and tricks. Um, about how to reinstall your um, propellers and things along those lines. So, um, so really that's kind of the majority of what I had to talk about, but I'm super interested in finding out if you guys have some additional um, questions that I can help with. Great, Garen. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited. I want to get my drones going. Uh, there are two questions that came in while you were presenting. Uh, number one, uh, besides the price, what else should we look for in a drone? Um, well, the ability for it to work with whatever tool you want to use to code with i think is a like i kind of did it the other way around where i bought the drone and said oh what does this work with and i made it work with you know i i was lucky and i found drone blocks um but i think maybe finding the app that you're comfortable with and like knowing what age group it's going to be um it's going to fit best with would be a driving force for me um, the other thing is I just read up a lot about the drones before you commit to one particular one. Um, I wish I had done that for the other drone that I had tried that just took off and flew into the wall and smashed into a ton of pieces um, because I would have known that that drone is not as stable. So looking for a drone that's stable, that's kind of the word that I kind of came across a lot. This drone, when it takes off, it takes off and it really hovers right in place. It doesn't sway and kind of go all over the place. And I think that that's really important when we're working with kids, so. Great, uh, so another the other question we have here, uh, Tina said, asked, do you think drone blocks would be good for high schoolers at least to begin with? Absolutely. I think drone blocks has a lot of, it's simplistic enough to get started, but it's sophisticated enough that you could really take it to the next level. As you saw, as those examples with the refracted code or the code uh, that used a lot of variables, it has a lot of capabilities. And I really believe that, um, that it, it could be, it's quite sophisticated and can do a lot. Absolutely. We've actually got uh, three more questions here. Uh, well, one is yeah, from Brian who said the Google Slides presentation through the Bitly link is asking for permission. So can you make it viewable? Uh, I will. Sorry, I thought I did that. Right on that. Okay. Uh, and we have a question here. Uh, well, actually, we have two more. So uh, let me go. Let me go in the order I have them on the screen here. Um, the question is how to implement coding in drones in language education. So do you have suggestions on implementing coding in drones in language education? I have to think about that for a bit. I, you know, I'm a technology teacher. So, um, you know, at language, you mean foreign language or English language arts? 
Um, I'm not I don't sure. Know. Yeah, I would have <laughs> to. I would have to think about that. Um, I really feel that there's an opportunity to integrate, you know, almost anything if we're creative enough, and that's kind of like our our thing here. So I'm uh, more than happy to kind of think about it. If you wanted to drop me an email, I'd love to like we could chit chat and kind of brainstorm something together. You kind of it for me. The integration works a lot better when I understand people's curriculum and kind of what their, um, you know, what their major goals are to accomplish. And then I usually can find some way to kind of push in and integrate. So I think I would just try to flip it around and have an opportunity to to chat with you somewhere, and we could probably figure something out together. Yeah, I totally agree. That's a great, and that's always a great strategy. I always like to be able to sit down, you know, whether virtually or in person, and actually work through the problems together. So that's always great. And the last question we have here, um, so do students take turns in the roles and how do you pick who gets what role? Um, yeah, so if, you know, for instance, for me, I don't have a lot of time with these kids. If I had more time, uh, we would definitely have uh, students rotate between each of the different roles. Um, but unfortunately, they get one, maybe two opportunities, two missions to do with me. Um, they really kind of decide amongst themselves. And if someone's like, you know, for instance, if a pilot, you really only need one person that's going to hold the device and hit, you know, launch mission and then abort if things go bad. Um, so if someone's like, you have two people that are super passionate about it, you're going to take, I mean, they're going to end up taking probably at least five to maybe 10 passes in order to get um, a successful flight. So just say, all right, guys, you know, this time you'll be the pilot, and next time you'll be the pilot and have people have dual roles. You know, I'm not like really freaky about, um, you know, saying, oh no, we can only have one of this, you know, share those roles. Everyone is just so excited to be doing this that there's really not a lot of fighting. It really is kind of amazing how when they are so passionate and so engaged that they're like, oh no, I'll do that. Okay, I'll do that. And they really just kind of gravitate to things that they're comfortable with. And I haven't had a problem yet where there wasn't a role that was filled. You know, everyone had a had a job and was happy with their job. Great. Well, thank you so much, Karen. I I can feel the energy and the excitement. And so uh, I hope other people felt that as well. Uh, coming up tomorrow, just as a quick reminder, uh, tomorrow we have Denise Wright, who will be talking about simple wearable electronics in tomorrow evening's session. And then again on Thursday, we have Taking Shape, Drawing Your Own Icons, followed by Using Makey Makey to Create Assistive Technology, and ending wrapping up with Using Video as Reflective, Collaborative, and Data Collection Tool. So thank you so much, everyone, who stuck with us through the little technical glitch at the beginning. Really appreciate it. Hope it was worth your time. And the recordings, again, will be available on my YouTube channel and on practicaledtech.com later this week. So send your, if you have a colleague or a friend who you think might be interested in it, uh, send them to one of those places on Friday, and they'll be able to get all this great stuff from Karen. Karen, could you put up your contact information one more time? Would that be possible? Absolutely. Bring that slide back up. And so there's there's Karen's contact information. If you have a question for her that uh, we didn't cover today, take a look right there. You can see her Gmail address or find her on social media or check out her website as well. So thanks so much, Karen, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you've picked up some new things, and have a great evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank thanks, you Karen. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.